All right, welcome back to another episode of Michael's Record Collection. I'm very happy to have with me today legendary rock drummer Corky Lang from the band Mountain. Corky, thanks for your time today. You're very welcome. It's my it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Where are you in the world right now? On the world, we're just outside Toledo at Bowling Green, at the Bowling Green University. Well, okay. we're not there. We will be there. We're at a club called Howard's, which is a great music uh, 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 location here in the Ohio Valley or wherever it is. And uh, it, it's quite nice. It's quite beautiful. And um, I am here with Richie Scarlett and Mark Michael, two of the best musicians I could find at this point. Uh, and uh, well, at this point, uh, as you know, Michael, a lot of our brothers and sisters are moving on in their life and moving on in their afterlife. So uh, we are doing a tribute, sort of a tribute tour to Leslie West and Jack Bruce. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the songs that I recorded and I played with them on these shows. And I have to say, Michael, I know yours is a sentimental type of show. So this is kind of a sentimental tour because 50 odd years later, these, this audience loves the repertoire. The repertoire has shown, you know, it's ubiquitous and it's, it's really a wonderful thing. It sounds corny to see these people show up to hear these songs. I am not playing the last number one hit song right now. I'm playing a repertoire that seems to have, it has the substance to maintain. And uh, I'm thrilled by it because again, a lot happened, as you know, a lot happened over the 60s and 70s musically, and it continues to happen, but somehow, somehow it's, it's, it's hanging in there. It's really, People love it. They really yeah. love it. And I love it. I mean, you know, I love play. It's not like wussy kind of material. I would be careful when I say that, but it's hardcore rock. And it's great to keep playing that way. I have to play every day, no matter what, just to maintain that energy. And then, of course, I try to bring in some technique, whatever that is. <laughs> and But it's a sentimental journey in a lot of ways. But we play it with a very current vibe. Okay. How's What's that? the newest song? What's the newest song in your set? The newest song would be Beautiful Flies. And okay. another set, Knock Me Over. Uh, these are from the new record I recorded, which is just coming out again because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. um, it's called The Toledo Sessions. Right. And it's, it's, I have to say it's one of the, my, my favorite records. A lot of it has to do with the newest. Mm -hmm. but, but the song Knock Me Over. Uh, when you go into a studio, if I'm rambling, by the way, Michael, it's because I've had 14 coffees. Okay. You know, so you're going to deal with that. <laughs> Shut me down anytime. The song itself, Knock Me Over, is very much an attitude. When you are on the road and you're traveling, you come back and you talk to your friends and they say, been there, done that. I hate that expression. I don't hate many things. But I hate that expression uh, because if you've been there, done that, you may as well just buy the farm. Forget it. You know, what's 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 ahead of you? So the song Knock Me Over is about that, the antithesis of that, where you want something that's really going to bolt you over. You mm -hmm. want to write something that means something more than anything you can anticipate, if I could say that properly. Yeah. Well, what I like the, about Knock Me Over is that it's a song with um, a bit of a slow tempo, but underneath your drumming isn't slow. Your drumming is actually, you know, a, a little bit faster than what you're, the, than the song that you're hearing. <laughs> I love the way you put that. It was a little <laughs> bit fast. I love it. The truth yeah. is when it came to that, I was having such a good time. It was kind of like I played everything I knew over the last 50 years. And, and I remember telling Mark, who was producing it, as I said, Mark, you may want to pull out some of that drum, so I'm really over the top. And Mark said, wait a second, it's your record. You can do anything you want. Play it. People don't mind that. And I appreciate you saying that because I did overplay it. But it does, yes, I, I, I played ahead of everything because, as you can see, I'm pretty wired up in my life. I guess that's why I play drums. But... Um, Anyways, I'm very happy with that record, the Toledo Sessions. Mm -hmm. And if I can be a promo slut right now, you can get 
that record on Amazon. It's available on Amazon, and uh, I don't know much more. But I have to say, if anybody doesn't like the record as much as I do, that to write me at my website at, at uh, CorkyLangWorks.com, and, and I will return it. I will return the money for the record. I've said that a few times over the past tour, and I'm glad to say people just love it. They just, it's, you know, uh, uh, the people that are, I respect, when they come back and they're brutally honest, they tell me exactly how they feel about whatever I'm doing, whatever anybody's doing. The brutal honesty is very valuable, especially with people you respect. And I'll say it again, the response has been terrific. You Period. do not have to return a lot of uh, people's money for this. Uh, you mentioned Beautiful Flies. That's the album opener. And it's it's definitely sounds like old school mountain. It's got that sound to it. It's got that flavor to it. Really. That's the biggest. That's one of the biggest compliments. I won't stop you. Carry on. Yeah, no, that's, that's when, you know, you get a lot of promos when you do this kind of thing and you, you get this thing and you're going, okay, what does this sound like? You know, and then you put it on your, and this one was one that grabbed me, that, that song grabbed me immediately. It was like, that sounds like mountain to me. So yeah, that I think you guys did a good job. But what I want to know from you, because I've seen it, it came out in 2019 originally, and I've seen it as Corky Lang, and I've also seen it as Corky Lang's Mountain. Which is it? It's both. What happened was the record company at first said, well, do you want to mention Mountain? Because you are uh, you're spot on with the fact when we were recording it, we have to have some sort of vision when you go into the studio. And this is off the floor. This is not like a lot of high-tech records. And I say it again, Mark, Michael, and at the time, Chris Shutters played beautifully. It was great to play with them. We just played. And as we moved along, we had to say, well, what song? What do you, you know, you have to have some relative um, uh, point to work from. And we did say, well, if we're doing it high energy, Let's go for some of the high energy mountain climbing songs because mm -hmm. uh, Nantucket Sleigh Ride was a little bit more aesthetically, uh, I guess it was just a little bit, I wouldn't say softer, but in a way, mountain climbing, when you make your first record, you're banging it out, yeah, uh, Michael, you know, you're, you're just doing the most you can. So that record has the energy. And uh, I just, um, and anyways, I'm, I'm thrilled that you see it that way, but we were looking to do the best we could to do that because I was very, very lucky. I, I lost you there for a bit, but yeah, I was really lucky to have co-written songs in, on that mountain record mm -hmm. because the, Leslie had a few songs, but Felix, it was new. He had just finished Cream and the Young Bloods, and he came in and from what he told me about the Creme d'Israeli Gears, they didn't really have that much material together. And um they wrote it on the spot. So it's, we did the very same thing in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, when we did this record, Toledo Sessions, we we did, we, we reflected on, let's say, The Road Goes Ever On. We were thinking a theme for an imaginary Western. You know, the broad sort of, um, I call it a, like a wave coming mm -hmm. in and an undertow. You, know, you have the undertow pulling you out and you have the wave coming in. I don't know if I'm uh, if I'm something's kicking in from the '60s, Michael, but I'm trying to explain something. <laughs> I'm trying to explain the attitude of certain songs. Yeah, There's, it, it's a little bit it's a little bit psychedelic, but I won't try to I won't try to get too far ahead of myself. Um, yes, thank you for the compliment, Michael. That's excellent. You, yes, I'll take the mountain, uh, you know, uh, relevant thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, now it's interesting that. I'm actually, I actually grew up in Ohio. So I'm going to ask you a question that I've asked a lot of my friends. How did you end up in Toledo? <laughs> oh, that's a good call. I'll tell you quickly. What happened is I had a buddy of mine, Kofi Baker, Ginger Baker's son. Mm -hmm. And he was playing around Long Island. He was playing New York. And he knew I was looking for a guitar player. I mean, I have to say, I get a lot of people saying, well, we, you know, they want to join up with me and play mountain songs. I didn't want to play mountain songs unless they sounded like the record, you know. In other mm -hmm. words, everybody's jamming on it. Warren Haynes, I'm going to digress. Warren Haynes, when I went to play with him at the Beacon, uh, he said, you know, Corky, 
when I, he, he was a mountain freak. He was terrific. And he said, I would invite you to play with me if I thought that you remembered the songs. And he was right. <laughs> Leslie and I, over the last years, have jammed so much. We went off to wherever and people didn't recognize the song. And that's serious stuff. So I remember coming back and saying, this is a couple of years ago, and saying, you know what? If I'm going to do mountain songs, I want to do with somebody that can, you know, project that mountain vibe. Kofi Baker, when he was playing down at the, um, at um, what was his name, the guitar player? Oh, gee, geez, uh, Les Paul. Les Paul's club in New York. Had, and Kofi says, come down, I've got this guitar player that I think could could really solve your, your problem with the projecting the mountain vibe. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him, and this guy, Chris Shutters, is playing with, uh, with Kofi. And apparently, Chris Shutters I, apparently was one of the top blues players uh, on the Chicago scene. So I got to know Chris Shutters, and he comes up to... Uh, up to where I'm living in Greenport to play. And his commitment just to say, yeah, let's hang out for a bit. And he said uh, he would love to do the repertoire. You know, we picked out a couple of songs and we, we played a few things. And then he said, I got a bass player I think you should meet. I think, he could, I think he's the guy we want to fulfill the trio. So mm -hmm. I drove with Chris all the way to Toledo from New York. Uh, that week or that, yeah, within that time zone. And I'd run into Mark Michael and his home studio. And immediately somebody says, why don't you come down to this club, uh, the Broken Bird or something, or some bird club to jam. So we go down there and Mark Michael has already learned the bass parts and the vocals. So there, it, it's just like we, we arrived, Michael, and we played. And it was like, it was brand new. And it was brand old, you know, it was right there. So that's why I ended up in Toledo, which, by the way, is a great town. Very heavy, heavy music. I remember I was there for the first week or two. Every night we go to a different place, different band, one band better than the other. Great musicians. I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised when Mountain was on the road. And we were on the road with Jack Bruce and Wes Bruce and Lang. Ohio's a heavy rock rock state, you know. It's yeah. it's the rock belt, and uh, so I wasn't surprised to be here. And we're back here again, playing a place called Howard's in Bowling Green, you know. And uh, it's great. The place is a great place. This is the first place we played uh, with uh, with with Mark and Chris, and now we have Rich uh, Richie Scarlett. Uh, with the most dangerous guitar player in the area. I love that. Dangerous. <laughs> Is that a musical term? You know? <laughs> Anyways, uh, and I'm not getting my hair right here, Michael. I, I'm sorry. I should have. You look great. Oh, thank you. Thank we you. We should all, you know, we should all have that much hair when we're your age. <laughs> I already have less. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I, I, the point is, is that it's a pleasure to talk about music and ohio there's some energy here that's really cool very cool you know and i i don't have to tell you out there in america and canada a lot of people are hurt you know the gigs the promoters it's really it's i don't know how we're going to get out of this musical uh you know pickup whatever you call it but um it's tough but you know what it's what we do, right, Michael? That's we just right. we just do this. Carry on. I'm talking too much. Go okay. ahead. Well, yeah, I love the Rust Belt. Got a, a soft spot for that. Obviously, I grew up there, and they've broken a lot of bands over the years from, from radio stations in Cleveland and Detroit and Toledo and places yeah. like that. So uh, I'm definitely uh, – I, I feel your vibe there. So tell me a little bit about uh, – I want to go back a little bit and, and talk about – Obviously, the song everyone knows, Mississippi Queen. Those were your lyrics and your drum parts. Those were already done. You brought those into the band. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I did. And Leslie took it home. You know, he sang that thing right away. Mm -hmm. I remember bringing in the lyrics, which I wrote in Nantucket uh, at a time when uh, a friend of mine brought up his girlfriend uh, from Mississippi. And she was dancing there with a see-through knitted dress in the middle of the summer there at this at this beach club. And I... I had taken some soul pills, so I was feeling pretty good. And and the lights blew out in Nantucket. It was like hot like it is right now. 
right mm -hmm. now, as a matter of fact, 51 to 52 years ago was when I wrote the song. And I remember everything, the power blew out. The only thing is the drums were fine because I wasn't electrified. So I kept playing and I started screaming this lyric. And I remembered it because they kept dancing. Michael, when you're playing the cowbell, people love to dance to the cowbell. <laughs> so I hit the cowbell. And that summer, that summer, I went back to New York with the band, with my band, Energy. And that's when Felix, Felix and Leslie asked me to join in and actually make the band Mountain. That's when it mm -hmm. became a band with Steve Knight. And that's so, just a month after Woodstock, you joined the band. Exactly right. Exactly right. Came in. And Leslie said, you got any songs? We got to get some material here. I went to his apartment and I, I actually had the lyrics that I wrote. I saved the lyrics, you know, because I went, wait a second. These lyrics, you can dance to these lyrics. It was basically your rap, if you want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, and I brought it, I put the left, I put the lyrics down within a New York minute, Leslie, da -da -da -da, and he's singing it. It was like it wrote itself, just like that. So I give Leslie lots of credit for that, you know. Yeah. And uh, But it was one of those songs that really just wrote itself. We brought it into the studio, and Felix says, what is this? I said, Leslie said, well, we got this thing. And I played the, the beat to Cripple Creek. If you listen carefully, back. <laughs> Do, 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 you know, okay. up on Cripple Creek, you know, and and so that's what I used, except louder, you know. Yeah, and it's such a different sounding song, but uh, yeah, you're right. Now I, I now that you mention it, I I envision it. Well, we were playing Cripple Creek during that song that that girl Molly from Mississippi was dancing to, yeah. and I didn't want her to stop. And it's a great dance beat. I remember going to Levon Helm's house and sitting there late at night, and uh, and I said, you know, Levon, I. I should really give you a credit on that. On you, you know, I was really improvising on Cripple Creek, and you know, maybe I mean I'll be very happy to give you a piece of the. And <laughs> Levon said, "Corky, music is a very special thing. You can do anything to music. Music don't care." <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> music don't care. You can do it. So I say, anyways, he he refused to take the credit for it, and. Um, Let's put, he was a big influence for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk about records, and I've, I've heard your show, and I know you talk about, you know, rem remembering what was your early influences mm -hmm. uh, audio-wise. And, yeah, the band were heavy, heavy influence. I go back farther, but, yeah, they were, they well, they influenced a lot of people, as you know. But mm -hmm. it's funny because we were very friendly with the band in Woodstock. <laughs> Leslie moved there. And it's, hey, we talk about two different approaches to music. You got mountain, you know, bada boom, bada bam, and you got you know got the band, you know, really that American beautiful cultural vibe. Mm -hmm. But they're both American. There's no question about it. Yeah. Anyways, uh, there I go again, Michael, rambling <laughs> on. There you go again. But uh, that's okay. I, I can hear you. I mean, you've been you've been around the the business so long. You you've got a ton of great stories. But what I'm interested in too is is now that Mississippi Queen is 50 years old. You could walk into a store, somebody's got the radio on and that comes on. What goes through your mind when you hear that song? Does, does it, do you still get that same thrill of the first time you heard it on the radio? That's funny you say that. We were at a, at a restaurant last, sort of a pub restaurant after our rehearsal yesterday. We walk in and they didn't know who we were or what, whatever. Richie Scarlett was sitting there. Some guy recognized Richie from Alice Cooper, you know. And mm -hmm. Richie were talking and, you know, Richie saying it being very cool. And all these people are gathering around our table. And sure enough, out of nowhere, Mississippi Queen comes on the radio. It couldn't have been timed better, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> if I was a little younger, I would have got lucky. But as it turned out, it was timely. Yeah, I got it. It's always a thrill. Come on, you listen to your stuff that's 50. That's what I'm saying. 50 years later, you know, these people are still coming to the shows and they love the repertoire. And a lot of them are very young kids, you know, saying, wow, my dad, my granddad told me about my great grandfather heard this record. Yeah. Um, boy, the point is, it's a thrill. It's that's always good. a thrill. They, see, because I, I know that some artists feel almost trapped by their they're popular songs and they feel they have to play them and then there are others who are so thankful that that people connected with those songs so i'm always uh, i'm always interested to find out 
So you know what, what let I mean? me ask you, Michael, what do you think when you play Mississippi Queen? Where do you go in your head? Oh, I just I go back to the probably the first time I heard it and and just hearing that beat and that guitar and the singing and all of it coming together and it's you know, but I feel like it's different for listeners that didn't create the music, but maybe it's not different. Maybe the for the musician it's the same. Well, the binaural part of it, right? You're listening, your head, your ears. If it's a certain sound, it will it will burn it up in your brain. I love it, you mm -hmm. know. But it, well, to answer your question, yeah, it's always a thrill. And there's two or three cents Canadian in your pocket for that too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you mentioned earlier that you know you go back further. What what kind of music did you listen to when you were young that got you interested in playing the drums? My mother loved cuban music we lived in montreal canada we mm -hmm. had no problem with with, with uh, cuba so my mother used to get these records these cuban records and she played them in the kitchen you know we lived in a modest house and that's where she had her little record phonograph and our bedroom was right behind it i have three brothers so the four of us slept in a bedroom you know and bunk beds right beside the kitchen and my, my mother and my father would dance to this Cuban mu music. I didn't really know, but started hearing the bongos and the cowbells. Now, I, I am not going to be pretentious about saying that I play Latin music. I don't. But the feel of the Cuban vibe is very sexy, very sensual. And it does, it, it gets to me all the time. Whether it's salsa or rumba, you name mm -hmm. it, my mother loved to dance to it. So my, my early influence, I don't even know if I knew what music was because my brothers and I, we would just listen to it because it came through the walls while my, while my, my parents danced. It was quite wonderful, actually. And then my sister would bring home these jazz records, Art Blakely and the Jazz Messengers, you know, John mm -hmm. Coltrane. Mm -hmm. all, and I had no idea about that, but this was when that jazz was coming up and... Um, yeah, uh, so the combination of that kind of, and of course, Gene Krupa, every drummer these days, there's no way you can't use Gene Krupa as a huge influence. I loved this mug. I loved the way he looked. He looked like he was, it was such a joy to play. A lot of drummers are pretty stiff when they play because they're concentrating. I mean, Joe Morello, brilliant drummer, but he's concentrating on the technique. Uh, there's a certain face that you make when you play. You can't check with it doesn't make any difference on the trumpet or the sax player because it's in their mouth but the expression of it on gene krupa and buddy rich and those guys it was a joy it was it was lifeblood you mm -hmm. know and uh i always connected with that you know i wish i was more technical but i i don't know can you swear on the show yeah do what you want man <laughs> you earned that right I, I fucking loved it. <laughs> it was, I loved it. I didn't know what I never say fuck or shit in front of a CHILD. <laughs> but I, anyways, yeah, I fell in love with it and I never fell out of love. I've yeah. run into I've run into drum Billy Cobham and a few drummers over the years, you know, who we played. We were on the road with West Bruce and Lang, ran into some amazing bands, you know. And the drummers are I'm hanging up my sticks. I'm not getting hot tired. You know, there's all kinds of uh uh, manic depression see that goes around with with especially drummers because if you're not playing you're dying you know i think it was dylan says you're not busy living you're dying and if you're not busy drumming you're dying so a lot of drummers hang up their sticks and they come back to them i don't remember ever hanging up my sticks and uh i don't know i just again i'll say it i fucking love it and I still, and I can't wait to get, get you know, get to, uh, to the, we're, we're rehearsing at Howard's today just to get a vibe going. And um, anyways, carry on, Mike. So when did you take that right turn into rock and roll music? Oh, oh, uh, when the electric bass came in. The electric bass. My buddy, George Gardos, we played in the school, high school band, and he had the stand-up bass. And that's that year or that time they were coming up with the bass amp, Ampeg bass amp, and they had the bass guitar. That's that's when rock started. That's that's when rock really started internationally, nationally, with the electric bass. Yeah, there were rock and roll records before that, but um, no, um, that's it. Mid sixties, 
Yeah. Did you remember? Do you remember the first record that you bought with your own money? Yeah, I do. I do. It was uh, Elvis Presley. You know, uh, was it Elvis Presley? All shook up. Yeah, Hound Dog. All shook up. Yeah, that, I remember going to the store and buying the seventy-eight at the time. God, am I? I'm sure you have a lot of people on your show that go back and go back and go back. <laughs> like, how old are you? Uh, and I remember, uh, yeah, I, I love I love the Four Seasons. You know, actually, I think the leader of the Four Seasons was the drummer. And if I go back to a lot of bands, the leader of some of the big bands were drummers. You know, Levon was the leader of the band. Mm -hmm. uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Uh, you know, uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palm. And you, you, they're all they're all part of um, they're all part of that that community. I got to tell you, up in Long Island, you're from Ohio. When I moved down from Canada uh, to New York, and of course, Leslie's from Long Island, you had all these drummers. I loved Dino Dinelli from the Rascals. I loved him. Uh, uh, Bobby Rondinelli, Sandy Gennaro, uh, Carmon Apici, all these guys. And I remember speaking to Carmon. I said, Carmon, do I have to change my name to Corky Linguini to be part of the cult? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're all yeah. these great all these great drummers that come from Long Island, you know, and, uh, but I'm not going to change. Uh, yeah. Carmine says, don't, don't bother changing the name. <laughs> it's, it's no big deal. Yeah. Um, anyways, go ahead, Mike. Are you, are you still, a, are you still a guy who listens to a lot of music or do you just spend more time creating it? I, that's a good question. You know, um, both 50, 50, you know, mm -hmm. I'm always thinking about writing and I'm really lucky to have a session. I went to Finland and there was a, a studio. Uh, my manager uh, lives there and I stay with her and we have a studio there. So I'm able to write all the time. And you, sometimes you can write too much, you know, and there's just a lot of ideas that get away. But I'm happy because uh, some of the bands over in Finland are, well, a certain band is picking up on the songs that we're writing there and some great musicians there. So when you ask, what do I do first? Um, I'm always listening. I think every musician's your oh, your ears are always attuned, you know, to something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, again, I go back to um, online. You can go anywhere with the YouTube now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the problem. You start you start looking on YouTube, seeing all these really unique videos and things. And uh, um, hold on. I'll Well, looks like a lost Corky there. We'll give him a minute here to see if he pops back in. Well, in case he doesn't come back, I do want to say you can get Corky Lang's uh, bundle at uh, prudentialmusicgroup.com slash store. And for $40, $39.99, you can get uh, Corky Lang's uh, The Toledo Sessions, which we were talking about earlier. Great album. Uh, on limited edition orange vinyl, you also get it on CD. And you get uh, his Pompeii Secret Sessions album on uh, limited edition yellow vinyl. So two vinyl albums and a CD for uh, $39.99. You also get a hand uh, a handwritten letter signed by Corky. So looks like we got Corky back. Are you there, Mike? I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, M Michael, I'm sorry. I just got all these phone calls that Charlie <laughs> Watts just died. Oh, no. Yeah, just that's what the interruption was. Oh, I'm, that's I'm terrible. Sorry about, I'm more sorry about Charlie. I heard we were talking about Charlie not going on the tour with them because he wasn't feeling well, uh -huh. you know. And then and I, between you and I, I said, I don't know about the Stones being on Stones without Charlie. You know, here we are talking about drummers. And yeah. sure enough, we get this. Oh, my, 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 you know, geez, you know, talk about it. A brilliant, really substantial human being. Really, yeah. he's a superman. Uh, well, okay, well, we can 80 carry years on. old. I, I just looked, I just looked, it's all over social media. That's terrible. Uh, that's going to have to listen to some stones today now to, uh, to uh, yeah. sort of mourn but, that. But uh, I don't, I don't know if the word's prophetic, you know, that we're talking about drummers here on this on this podcast but wow wow well we're all you know i've been faced with a few uh a few mates uh who have passed on leslie mm -hmm. went last christmas and uh 
You know, the only thing you could say, and, and this is where you come in, Mike, and I'm not blowing smoke here, but the fact that you got shows reminding people of songs, of material, what really kept them alive mm -hmm. before whatever they feel and after whatever they feel, all these people, they'll be around forever. You know, Leslie yeah. West will be around forever. I happen to be physically here talking to you, but um, you talk about recording, you know, the... The immortal words and 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 songs that come from come from these people, uh, but it is that time in our life, isn't it, Michael? I'm starting to, I'm starting to fade out here. There, it is that time in our life where um, we can expect these calls. You know, yeah. you start. I think it happened after uh, you get into your 50s, 60s, and it, it, before this, it was a drug-oriented death. But now it's it's a natural death in many cases now, yeah. which I don't know if that means anything. But uh, well, Michael, um, I have to say I'm a little bit I'm a little bit a uh, little bit upset about this. Yeah. Charlie, uh, he he wasn't a best friend, but I I knew him on many occasions, and one of them quiet, sort of like me, quiet, right, right, Corky, yeah, shy like <laughs> shy like me, right, Corky, yeah, you got it. No, he was a beautiful pe human being. I mean, apart from being, he was never a rock and roll star. He mm -hmm. was a rock and roll music. He was a jazz musician, actually. Now that we, I don't, have you ever heard some of his records, some of his, his uh, Charlie Watts' records? Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of the, the Stones uh, individual stuff. It's, it's all kind of all over the place, kind of like the Stones were at times. Yes, yes, very jazz oriented. Um, I would dedicate this this particular show myself to Charlie. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm really sorry for his, but, but I'm sure, I'm sure he had to be mighty ill to die. You know what I mean? You know, I don't know that he did a heroin overdose. I doubt very much. Yeah. But um, wow, wow, yeah, I would dedicate this show to him. Yeah, that's too bad. It's it's. I mean, we've all had our lives touched by their music. You talk about the immortality that music gives uh, these musicians. And, of course, the Rolling Stones are going to live forever through their yep. music uh, and through all the lives they've touched through their music. So, um, you know, is, is there anything from the Rolling Stones that particularly sticks out to you? Shit, I loved every uh, black. What was it? Painted Black. I love, I love that. Charlie's drumming on that. And I believe it was Charlie's, you know, the bass part and yeah, uh, paint it black. Yeah. I could, I think we can paint a few things black, but try to stay a little optimistic on this particular <laughs> rap. Um, yeah. Paint it black. I well, think right now. Well, you were gone. I was telling, uh, I was telling uh, the viewers and, and the listeners that they can get your, your bundle at Prudential Music Group dot com slash store and it's got the the toledo sessions on orange vinyl and on cd and your pompeii secret sessions limited edition uh colored vinyl and you get a a letter hand signed by you how did that start how did that happen <laughs> well the guy there's a i have some friend i don't know if you ever heard of uh jason Heartless Jr. He's a drummer that I was teaching him when he was six years old, way back. I taught him how to taught him. I didn't really teach him. He did it. But he would, yeah, I influenced him over the years back and forth. His father started a record company with this company, Prudential Insurance. I, weird thing. And he really, he heard I was doing these sessions in Toledo. And he said, I'd love to put it out on our label. Uh, at the time, it was, I think it was Third Man Records, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, third, you know, the the White Stripes. What's his, Jack. Jack. Jack, yeah. Jack started this company, Third Man Records, which is out of Detroit. And uh, Jason Hartless, my buddy, put his record label on the distribution of third man records which is out of detroit and and he's a promotion guy jason hartless they you know it's not a big record company but they're terrific and he's it's a vinyl company he says i'd love to put it out on vinyl i said great talk about old school you know and i said fine so the toledo sessions are available on this vinyl and then he he found this record secret sessions which i've done over 
It's a compilation I've done over the last 30 years mm -hmm. that I've worked with different people. And so I chose the songs that I personally liked. And it turns out Todd Rundgren, Eric Clapton, Ian Hunter, Mick Ronson, they all played on these records over the years. And Jason Hartless wanted to release it. And you have to give it for the record store day. You have to give it a name of a band. You can't just have it secret sessions. So uh, <laughs> it was a joke. We were in Woodstock recording some of that, uh, one part of that way back in the late 70s. And in the town, they called us Pompeii because we were on top of the mountain there. And we, you know, and though this was the early, early, late 70s, early 80s. And all the people, they would, it, you know, the, the dinosaurs are up there in Pompeii. So they <laughs> named the record because all the people on there, I think most of them are still alive. But, you know, Mick Ronson, some brilliant people, brilliant players. Felix is on there. Leslie's on there. Uh, Ian Hunter, like I said. Eric Clapton, there's a uh, John Sebastian's. I mm -hmm. mean, there's a lot of great musicians. And what I'm saying to you right now is I was very proud. I was very proud of the material itself. It wasn't just jamming. I mean, yeah. these were songs that were written. Uh, and some of them were pretty good. They weren't hit records for that mm -hmm. matter. But um, I forget where I'm going with this. I'm rambling on here. Just, uh, you guys uh, you guys put this thing out and it was interesting. Yeah, I was Jack, listening I, to it. Yeah. And Jason, <laughs> Jason Hartless said it will be great these, since they're such... Well, there, it's a unique release. It's not just an everyday release. It's yeah. especially, do you want to write a letter? And I said, fine. <laughs> I write a, you know, I, I don't consider, you know, uh, these people that come to shows as fans, you know, I'm not like a celebrity. They're, they're friends. They're friends. So I, I said, sure. Right. So I write letters every now and then. He'll mm -hmm. write something for a certain release. And uh, I guess it's, I take it personally. I take this business I'm not the business personally. I take the music personally. Uh, the business, do what you want with it. There's nothing much to do right now, actually. But yes, so I, yes, I like to write songs and write letters to people who write. That's why the book is called Letters to Sarah. It's a, it's, it's a book that I wrote. Uh, that's also that's also available on that's Amazon. On Amazon, I was going to get to yeah. that. I was going to I was going to segue into that, but I'm glad you did. It was uh, it's your autobiography, but it's, it's largely written in excerpts from letters that you actually wrote to your mom, and your mom kept them. Yes, that's exactly right. And my manager, who's now my partner, uh, Tuja Takala, she is she works at the University of Helsinki and she worked at the University of Manchester. She's a terrific gal and very so when we were she says, I went to your Wikipedia when we started working together. I went to your Wikipedia and she said, It's awful. It's all over the place. She says, because she was gonna manage, I gotta put this together. So at the time she was coming down to where I was working in Long Island, where I, I had stored these boxes that when my mother passed, they were all packed up. I didn't know my mother was keeping these letters. Like over 30, 40 years, I'd write, you know, I'm on the road. It gets pretty lonely out there, Michael, you know, after the show. You're at Carnegie Hall, it's wonderful, the people are good. And then you go back to the hotel, it's pretty lonely. So I used to write my mother and just update her. Of course, probably had a buzz or two, a couple of drinks, but I'd write her and just tell her, well, Mama, I mean, you know, I can't believe it. Here I am at Carnegie Hall. And, you know, do you remember I played in Hotel Motel? And it was their letters that she kept, which was very charming. And Tuja, my partner, found the letters, and she's the one that put together the book. And she just said, Cork, I know there's a lot of musicians writing books about, you know, snorting ants off the kitchen table, whatever, with Ozzy Osbourne. She says, I won't do that. We won't write, no, you know, the diary of a heroin addict. She wouldn't do that. She says, these letters are real. And these letters were written over your ascent, as I ascended through the music business or career from when I played local places and out of Montreal and, and Toronto. And uh, it was a one, hey, I was very lucky to have that, but I wrote my mother and I couldn't believe it. So it's, there's a chronicle of all these things. And I don't know if you call it a memoir, uh, 
but call it what you want. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to say memoir because it's not quite everything. Mm -hmm. It's just. It's just what happened with those letters. And I don't know anybody that writes letters these days. <laughs> Anyways, do you? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lost art. It's it's actually one of the things that when I was researching this, I didn't know about the book, and I can't wait to get it now because that's that's the kind of thing I'm interested in. It's it's your thoughts at the time. It's a real time capsule. Well, I, yeah, I hope you enjoy it, Mike. I do. I, I, it took a couple of years, and Tulia kept track. Well, they were right there, letters. She just, oh, you know, whether it was 1963, 1968, going through Nantucket, coming, mm -hmm. joining Mountain, then going to England, West Bruce. And it was, what a trip, Mike. It was great. It, yeah. But it's in the book. It's in the book, but it's... It's not flattering. There was a lot of very down times, you know, which I didn't. Until he says, no, just tell it like it is. Tell the truth, which whatever's going on. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope yeah. people can can get hold of it because uh, because uh, I think they'd like it. You know, it's, it's 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 a story. It's a story. It's a real story. And I'm really glad to be here. And I still have a pulse to tell you about it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it is working. You, you, still get that on, uh, you get that on Amazon still, I think. And um before we turn the page on Pompeii, one thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about was you guys did a cover of a song that's not an obvious cover. You guys did a cover of Randy Van Warmer, Just When I Needed You Most. Who's I, was that your idea? That's a great song. I, I've always loved that song. Uh, that's, you remember Albert Grossman? Uncle Albert. Albert Grossman, the manager. Okay. Jazz. Anyways, I was hanging with him and his beautiful wife um uh as sally she was terrific randy was up there and paul butterfields and we're hanging at this bar in dino's in woodstock all of us sit around and uh and randy says i got this song i'm writing and i didn't know who he was and paul butterfield said it's a great song man you got it he says i'm gonna record it this is paul butterfield <laughs> i'm gonna record it so paul butterfield starts singing to me you packed in the morning I put, you know i mean i'm going yeah. wow and that's and then I was in the studio doing the secret sessions or that part of that. And we go up to the studio and and, and, and Paul Butterfield's a piece of work. You know, you don't get nothing gets in his way. I'm sitting on the microphone doing another seat. Come on, you packed in the morning. I stared out my window, wondering why <laughs> it just took over. And and Albert Grossman walks in because it's Bearsville Studios. He walks in. What are you guys doing? And I said, you know, Albert, it's a great, I was doing my record, my solo record. Uh, and I said, uh, I remember hearing it. And Albert said, as I said, I want to do it. Albert says, well, we're saving that song as a single. We, we think this is a hit record. I said, of course it's a hit record, but I don't know if I'm going to make it a hit record because I have a very woody voice. And, and Randy's got this beautiful soprano voice. And, <laughs> and so I, we, Ian was there, started playing acoustic and Felix, and we were, you know, and Felix is a Felix Papillari, he's a folky. So mm -hmm. we we did a version. I loved it, but it was in in a weird key, you know, it was in like an open open key, open string key. Anyways, so we played it and we called it the Woody version, you know, <laughs> because I did put it. Albert says you can record it, but you can't release it as a single. Yeah, and it's funny because I mixed it at Criteria Studios, and where did he record, Randy? Randy went to Criteria in Miami with these producers, and they did a a real single treatment and beautifully done. I was very proud to have discovered it with Paul. You know, it's kind of one of those things you feel, you know you find a song, uh, and uh, <laughs> I just you brought that up. That's very funny because. Like you said, it gets no attention at all except for some audio files that go, wait, what was that? That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that, was, that, was, that was recorded in Woodstock, not like an acoustic version. And um, I never played it live. I should play it live. It's a great song, great song. Yeah, it's one of those songs I think that people don't, like just hearing me say the name of it, they might not think back to what it was, but if they heard it, they would go, oh yeah, I remember this song. That's right, you that's know. right. But I always have gravitated to those songs, those 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 kind of songs that fall through the cracks. I've always gravitated towards those types of singles, and that one's always stuck with me. And it's sad, sad that Randy's no longer with us either. So, yeah, Randy, I don't, what, have, have you checked on? Is Randy still around? I think Randy passed in like two thousand four. 
Oh wow! Because he was he was a young dude. He was young. Well, yeah. he was young. Everybody was young back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, wow. Yes. Well, I guess maybe I will put it in my solo set now that you brought it up because it's in a, it's in a weird key. It's very low. You packed in. It's very low, but it's a, it's a sentimental song. But yeah. Well, I'm glad you liked it, uh, Mike. We have one guy that that bought it. Uh, <laughs> what uh what keeps you going what what makes you keep doing music and 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 not just like calling it a day ego i got i got to do it for my ego i love to perform you know that's this 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 COVID thing is along with many many performing musicians it's killing us it takes it out you got you mm -hmm. know what i mean it's just i've all, i really never cared i should i really never cared about the money because i was having such a good time it shows now because I haven't got any money. You know, I never cared. But no, I'm not complaining. I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky. I've had some uh, some terrific mates and terrific friends, uh, terrific women in my life. And I just think you surround yourself with it, and you got to keep them happy. You got to progress. You got to perform. Everybody's got to perform. You're you're here. You're, whatever you're doing, you're performing. We're all doing it. Uh, that's what keeps us all going is waking up in the morning, putting the shoes on the floor and saying, am I going to walk on these things and move forward or, uh, or am I just going to give up? And as a drummer, you, you make up your mind, you're going to keep running and you keep those bass drums going. And it's kind of like any kind of athlete, you know, why are you climbing that mountain? Because it's there. Why are you playing that song? Because it's there. And I do it because if there's an audience there, I'm there. And, you know, as you could tell, I'm pretty shy, pretty quiet guy. Yeah. And I, th I think, I just think we're very lucky. And keeping in mind, to be a teenager in the 50s was to be a nobody. To be a teenager in the 60s was to be an everybody. And I was lucky, and I suppose you were lucky to be able to experience to experience that time, that soundtrack, you know. And I'm caught up in the soundtrack of my life, and I'm going to play the drums to that soundtrack. How's that? That's what I feel. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Do you have a favorite uh, piece of work from your career that you know that you always think back on it that particularly stands out as something you're proud of? Yeah, yeah, there's one that I liked, Ultra Rock, with the sax player from the Stones. Uh, we did a session, he he invited Felix and I in, uh, come on, Cork, what's his, Bobby, sax player in the Stones, come on, Cork, I can't believe it, I'm, my head's all over the place when it comes to the Stones right now, yeah. Bobby, come on, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. He played, he had, it was his solo record. And it's a song called Ultra Rock. And okay. uh, uh, Bobby Keys. On. There you go. Thank you. You win behind the first curtain. Okay, Bobby <laughs> Keys. And uh, yeah, I just loved my drumming there because I was actually playing with Charlie Watts' drum set because this wow. is over at Trident Studios. I believe it was his set. And, and I also played on his set as we're talking about Charlie, I played on his set at Bearsville because the Stones were rehearsing there. And I remember I got a call from his drum roadie, Michael. He says, listen, I see you have a Heyman drum set. Heyman, which is an English drum set. They're known for play, you know, doing uh, guitars and um, basses. Jack Bruce had a Heyman. And Charlie was flipped out that there was a Heyman drum set at Bearsville. Could he use it while he's rehearsing? Because they usually he usually use Gretsch. And I said, it would be a bill. Chad, go ahead. And I'll tell you, Mike, he walked in and tuned that drum set that I never had a drum set tuned like that. It wasn't anything special. It was like right on. The bass drum was big. It was the Rolling Stones bass drum. And I was playing. And it was a different session than the one that I was with with Bobby Keys. But yeah it was i don't know i'm all over the place right now uh michael but um 
I forget what we were talking about. That's understandable. I, I was just asking you about the, you know your something that stood out that you played on and and you you answered the question, so that's great. You have played with everyone from. I mean, you mentioned some of the guys on on uh, Secret Sessions already. Just incredible lineup: Ian Hunter, Eric Clapton, Dickie Betts, John Sebastian, Mick Ronson, Leslie West. Uh, you played with Bo Diddley, John Lennon, Mahogany Rush. Ten years after Meatloaf, uh, Men Without Hats. How did that happen? How did you get involved with <laughs> Men Without Hats? Because these are some you're digging deep. I got a call from Montreal. I was in between millions. I couldn't get arrested after I went off, you know, we were off the road. This is not nah, that bad. It's got to be the late 80s. I finished with meatloaf. I was really feeling sorry for myself. A friend of mine turned me on to Polygram Records in Canada. They were looking for an A&R guy. So I said, it's good. I went up to Montreal and they hired me as an A&R guy for Polygram Records. And, they, and we started, the first thing they said, the president of the company, who was from Germany, uh, said, we have a problem. We've got to get men without hats into A&R, excuse me, into, into like a rock vibe. Right now, they're in a pop vibe. So they asked me somehow to take men without hats from uh, safety dance to some sort of rock vibe. So I said, it's very simple. Just put guitars in their hands instead of all the keyboards. And I did that. And I think the second record they came out with, it sold really well. I was working for Polygram, and hence I got a chance to work with them. Um, and uh, that's the story. <laughs> I just laugh when you bring that up because it's kind of like a and r is what you do anyways as a drummer. You're always picking material and trying to find what, you know, what, what, the, what highlights the material, et cetera. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, Yes, I worked for Polygram. I became vice president of A and R at Polygram in Canada, and then they got bought over by A and M Records, so they kicked everybody out. Mm -hmm. But I had a chance to work with some great, great musicians. You know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and yeah, and that was one of them. Uh, men, I think they're on the road still. I think they're up. Yeah, there. I think they're getting ready to release a new album pretty soon. Uh, yeah, I, I believe. I hope so. they do well. I hope they do well. They had a really good. The, I'm not going to get into any criticism and be an observation. Uh, it was a family thing. They were brothers. I'm not sure if the brothers are still together, mm -hmm. but it was a sibling rivalry is what it was. Yeah. Okay. So that's the story of Polygram. That yeah. could be tough. Uh, Corky Lang, thank you so much for your time. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, I don't want to take up any more of it. I know you got a, uh, a lot to do. I, I'm glad you're on the road. I hope that uh, I can get a chance to get out and see you. Um, Toledo Where are you? Sessions. I'm I'm in Orlando, Florida now. Are you oh, heading okay. down this way? Yes, I am. We're coming down to play a show, big show actually, in January. Good time of year. It's uh it's a big festival. Keep your eye. If you go to CorkyLangWorks.com slash live, it has it has the schedule. Hopefully everybody's happy, everybody's safe and healthy, and they'll show up. And the shows will go on. Mm -hmm. Because right now. It's very touch and go, you know, but yeah. yes, we'll be in, I love Florida. We'll be in Florida for a yeah, while. That's a good time of year to be here in January. <laughs> it is. It's actually um, my, we're playing on my birthday. I remember that. Oh, so, nice. I'll, so, I'll, so I'll be another year old. Go figure. Another year. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Well, thank, uh, thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. I'm going to run and do what I do, what I do and, uh, and play, you know. All right. Thank you so much, Corky. I appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye now, and love Take to care. everybody there, okay? Bye-bye now.